a new documentary. You know, we love HBO documentaries. They do some of the best ones. Uh, Breslin and Hamill, Deadline Artists, and the producers, the three producers and filmmakers are here with me now, one of whom is my colleague whom you all know. The last time he was here, we were talking baseball. You're right. <laughs> and the Cubs and the Yankees and yeah. whether Babe Ruth pointed or not. So right. uh, Jonathan Alter is here uh, along with John Block. How are you, sir? Fine, thank you. Welcome nice to, to Sirius you. XM. Appreciate that. And Steve McCarthy, how are you, sir? Great, thanks for having me. Welcome Mark. to you both. Yep. Congratulations on the film. I've seen thanks. it. It's excellent. Oh, thank oh, you. Oh, good. Thank you. Good, I'm glad you so, caught it. So, believe it or not, true story, um, I moved to New York not just nine years ago, but all his life, my dad, who lived in Washington, D.C., never lived in New York, never wanted to live in New York, all his life he read the New York Daily News every day. Wow. He would religiously go to the newsstand and read the New York Daily News. Hmm. That's how I found out about Breslin and Hamill. Uh, and I know uh, Dick Gregory used to get about 50 papers a day. <laughs> and he would keep up with all of it. But these guys were really um, cut from their own mold, weren't they? They really were. And, you know, uh, superficially they had a lot in common, both Irish-American right. columnists from the outer boroughs of New York, uh, not college educated, um, but their styles and their approaches could often be very different. And they were so big, Mark. It's it's impossible for us to imagine now. But you have a print journalist, Jimmy Breslin, who is hosting Saturday Night Live. Yeah, I remember. You yeah. know, and and doing like <laughs> beer ads and grape right. nuts ads, and then you have another print columnist, Pete Hamill who's dating the most famous woman in the world, Jacqueline Onassis. Right. At the same time, he's dating a top movie star, Shirley, Shirley McClay. Yeah. And then Jimmy's writing a column about who right, his right. friends should <laughs> be dating. But I, I mean, I mentioned that sort of you know entertaining part of the story just to convey that they they uh, it was sort of when giants strode the earth kind of uh, uh, story. They, they, they were that big and but the main thing that I think we wanted to convey, and, and a lot of this film is about race and class sure. in New York, is that they were always on the side of the little guy, mm -hmm. speaking truth to power, uh, comforting the afflicted and afflicting the comfortable. And we have uh, not just Spike Lee, but uh, Earl Caldwell and the late Les Payne, these two revered African-American columnists in New York who just they they cannot be effusive enough in their praise right. of these two white guys yeah. like they are basically saying that at a time when nobody was standing up for african americans in the city of new york jimmy breslin and pete hamill were steve how did they get to be so big in the first place well in those days newspapers were everything especially these two especially the new york daily news was the largest circulation newspaper in the united states for a while so they were really really big but they also too uh, they used to say there was the most dangerous place in New York was between Jimmy and a camera. You know, he they just <laughs> loved the publicity. Jimmy really soaked it up. Yeah. He was writing books. They were making movies out of them. They were on the sides of buses. They were on and billboards. You'd see them everywhere all the time. So that's how they gained this audience. But there was a, a thing about it, too, is that you would buy the Daily News to see what Jimmy's take was on Crown Heights mm -hmm, riots. Mm -hmm. You would buy the Daily News to see what Pete was talking about, about the latest police scandal. They, they actually drove sales to those things. So the model isn't the same anymore. It's all blown up with this disruption we have in the media. So it's hard to imagine, as John said, just exactly how big and important they were in this town. They were also national figures, too. Like you did, your dad yeah. read them in, in D.C. Right. They were syndicated and, and, and spread out through the, the nation, too. But in New York, they were really part of the heart and soul of New York. And they were part of a progressive tradition, too. Right. You know, you right, talk right. about, John says about... Um, sticking up for the little guy and African-Americans and stuff. These were Irish Catholic guys. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We, we aren't really known for doing that, you know. <laughs> right, yeah. they, 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 there's been some right. issues with that. Right. So they went against their tribes. So they were they were just spectacular. Yeah. Yeah, they weren't afraid yeah. to, uh, to go against prevailing, crowd-pleasing uh, opinions. And uh, Did they you might not agree, but you, but, but, but you certainly took notice. Well, that's why you, you were in my mind, John. That was my next question for you. Did uh, they influence opinions as a matter of fact did some people read them who might not have had that opinion previously and then be changed by a jimmy breslin or or pete hamill column 
they definitely moved the dial. They made you pay attention. And one of the, probably uh, one of the most uh, striking stories had to do with the uh, Bernard uh, Getz case, right, right. the uh, so-called uh, uh, subway, subway vigilante. gunman. Yeah, yeah subway, subway vigilante. vigilante. The death wish gunman. That's right. Because because he had a, a lot of popular support. And then Jimmy wrote, "No, this ain't y'all looking at this the wrong way." Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> How did he get shot in the back? And and uh, yeah, he got shot the kids in the back. He defended yeah. himself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. And then it turned out later. You know, after almost everybody in the city, Les Payne, was this wonderful uh, columnist who died, you know, after we uh, right. were finished with the film, um, and he was uh, a columnist for Newsday, where Jimmy uh, also worked at one point. They all worked everywhere, but, you know, he said that during the Getz uh, case, it was Jimmy Breslin against the entire city of New York. Yeah, like, was, even yeah. really liberal people were so fed up with crime that they thought, all right, well, these these young thugs on the on the subway, they had it coming. They were hassling this guy, and he he shot them. But then Jimmy learned from good reporting that they had been shot in the back. You know, they were, and then he had emptied his gun into them. When they finally caught Getz, he was at large for a while. And when they finally caught him, and we, you see this on on uh, prison video in in the film, mm. you could tell he's he's a lunatic. Yeah, you know yeah. he was just a stone killer. He just wanted to kill black people. Yeah, and and by that point, then everybody goes, oh okay, Getz is a bad guy. But earlier on, it was just Jimmy. He was the only one who was standing up yeah, for them. Yeah, there's a scene in uh, the Phil Donahue show where he is he is put out, you know, you're whistling a very lonely tune. And Jimmy yeah, says, that's what Phil says. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, Jimmy says, it's the law. You're not supposed to shoot people in the back. I mean, it's, yeah. no matter who they are. Right, right, right. And, and I mean, same, that was an important statement for him to make at the time, standing up against everyone. You want to say something, John? The same could be said for... <clears throat> Um, uh, Mr. Pete Hamill, who uh, spoke out uh, uh, against a man named Donald Trump uh, back in the 80s uh, with respect to the uh, Central Park Five. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Donald came right out, came out right away and said they're guilty and they should be executed. Yeah, yeah, these are these are five young African American teenagers who were in in Central Park at around the time a woman w jogger was raped, and they went to prison. I think for six years. Yeah, and then Spike Lee in the film is just mm -hmm. scathing about this. You know, then it turns out they were innocent. Trump Trump talks on TV endlessly in 1990 about how they need to be fried now. They need to be executed. These kids must die. Without a they trial. hadn't even been indicted, yeah. mm -hmm. much less had a trial, and they turned out to be innocent. So you see, you know, a an early Donald Trump. Uh, <laughs> right, right. And then a lot of the rest of the film, you know, we don't mention Trump, but the subtext is. Yes, there's some good journalism going on now, but we need guys like this. Yeah, yeah, uh, and 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 obviously they're missed. In fairness, though, they they were big too because they were here in New York. I true. mean, you know, if you're not here in New York, you're just not quite as big, are you? That's true. <laughs> you know, they had That's Mike true. Royko in their town in Chicago. Yeah, well, I'm from Chicago. Mike Barnacle up yeah. in Boston. Right, right. There are, but you're absolutely right. New York is the media capital, and uh, so everything was amplified even more. And and being here too, John. Because they were so visible here in New York and their style of writing, they influenced a lot of other writers coming along around the country, didn't they? They sure did, including me. I'll never uh, write quite as many adverbs again, thanks to uh, Jimmy and Pete. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, um... Concrete nouns and active verbs. That's yeah. right. They're, uh, every every single word in their eight hundred word columns packed a punch. But Jonathan, they too, they were really. As, as I was reading some of the things that they wrote, and, and I remember them as well, they were almost nonfiction novelists, weren't they, in, in, the, in the way they wrote, in the, the poetry in which they wrote. Yeah, they I told mean, we, a story it, rather than today. So today, you know, and, and with all due respect uh, to people, I know they're doing the best they can, but the, the style of journalism now where it's just as few words as possible, really it's a tweet, yeah. you know, 240-character journalism, they wouldn't have made it. In this environment, would they? I mean, they would have written about how stupid that was. Wouldn't yes, they? <laughs> they would have. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's unfair to some very talented younger people that we have today coming up in the business who are doing really good work. Right. And there's a lot of good investigative reporting going on about Trump. But the storytelling, you put your finger on it, Mark, th this is what is compelling for the, the reader. And, 
you know, the New York Daily News used to have 450 journalists. They have 45 now. Yeah, yeah. You know, these newspapers have been slashed. And, and we call the film Breslin and Hamill Deadline Artists because they're really, there was an artistry to what they did. And a, a lot of the film is how, uh, how to write well. And you, you see their writing, you hear their writing. And, um, you know, you realize that you can do really fine work of literary quality. They were, as Steve said, they were also novelists yeah, cranking out their yeah. own books, but just on a daily basis, right. they would write this beautiful prose that uh, would comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. So I, so I see uh, a double meaning, Steve, in Deadline Artists, because mm. they were on Deadline using their artistry, but it's mm. also kind of, to me, symbolic of the, the death of an era. Yes. They're, they're the two yes. of the last great lines who did that. Yeah. So it, it, Jonathan noticed about me, as long as we've known each other, my, my training in school was print journalism, not broadcast. And you know, I just kind of fell into broadcasting and, you know, I guess God just smiled upon me because if, if he hadn't, I'd be in the position <laughs> of, of everybody else right now. Yep. Um, I grew up in Nashville and when um, I went back home for a time after school, I didn't stay obviously, but uh, John Sigenthaler, who was running the Tennessean yeah, at the time, great editor. said to me, he said, Mark, if you come back home, you got a job here. You know, and I just didn't stay. I didn't stay home. Um, but, you know, I, I think it also was symbolic as I watched the film. It, it was it was sad to me because I like to write like that, too. You know, I kind of always um, wanted to emulate James Baldwin in my style of writing, even in journalism. It should tell a story. It should e evoke yeah. some type of emotion. And you want to use and that's what they did. You want to use the techniques of a novelist, right? Thank that you. was new thank journalism, you, thank you, thank right, you. to, to yeah. create this. Jim, Jimmy, of course... Um, laughed it off and said, "I was just doing sports page stuff, you know, right?" That's, that's <laughs> yeah, he was saying. minimizing. What but he was Tom doing. Wolf right, actually right. says in the film that Breslin was one of the developers of new journalism. So you take, you know, take something that's happening. The best example is Emergency Room One, Death in Emergency right, Room right, One, right, where right, right. you are in the room with John F. Kennedy's body, mm -hmm. Jackie, the doctor, and the priest. Jimmy has taken you in that room and created this world. Obviously, that wasn't what happened. There were nurses and orderlies running around and stuff, but he created this whole scene, and you really felt like you were witnessing history yeah. when he wrote this. And it was all accurate. You know, it was based on real, rigorous reporting. And he believed you had to go to the story, and Pete also. You couldn't just, you know, sit home on your computer, mm -hmm. like, reading Mm -hmm. blogs or whatever mm -hmm. and he even thought the phone was too distant that you had yeah, to go right, to right. the story climb yeah, the right. tenement steps and and uh um but um that's what i tell my superiors here i have to go to travel to yeah. go to the yeah i don't always get my you gotta go the devil the, <laughs> the devil is in the so details you all know we do they can say y'all yeah. seeing them they're yeah, saying this you gotta go. To go on the road in, with this in, guy in yeah. in, in, the, in, in memory of of, of jimmy and, and in <laughs> honor of pete <laughs> series exam y'all need to send me on the road more okay go ahead yeah it's really true yeah, yeah no and, and to go to it when you don't you get better stuff when you go of course of course to peer inside the soul of the story you have to be there the devil's in the details and you have to come face to face with the story yeah um, um, they the two of them were also on the scene when RFK. Yeah. Right, they were both just inches from Robert Kennedy when he was assassinated. Mm -hmm. and they wrestled Sirhan Sirhan to the ground. Jimmy was at the Audubon Ballroom. Yes, when he was. Malcolm X was shot. He was he was off having a smoke in the basement because, as he wrote later, you weren't allowed to smoke uh, in, uh, a in, in a Muslim gathering. In a Muslim gathering, but. He writes, this is typical, but but you were allowed to kill somebody. Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. So Malcolm X is being that. killed upstairs. He hears the gunshots. He runs up. We didn't have room for the fact that he arrives just shortly after John Lennon has been assassinated. Uh, so, you know, they were there for so yeah. many yeah. of the big stories of the uh, latter part of the 20th century, the last 50 years of the 20th century. But I think especially, Mark, on race and class in New York. And... You know, at one point, I, I think it's it's Bob Costas. Uh, um, Jimmy is on his right, right. show after Jimmy has been beaten up in Crown Heights. He takes a cab to a riot in Crown Heights. You know, mm -hmm. which was it was a, a a disturbance involving Orthodox Jews and African Americans, and it was a real riot. And he goes right into the middle of the riot fearlessly. He gets beaten up by African Americans, and Bob asks him on on a TV show, you know. Well, you know, how do you, you know, feel after after you're standing up for them, 
all these right, years right. And, and you get beaten up and he just thinks the question is ridiculous yeah. you know he's not he even says, a, i haven't done them very well they're still there aren't they <laughs> you know? well yeah he hasn't done much yeah, yeah, enough right. for them they, right. they still yeah. have you know so. a series of problems but he just was kind of contemptuous of the idea that um being beaten up would somehow affect his very broad and and deep sympathy for for african americans and he really his whole life he had a uh, a really unusual relationship with how did the that African come, American come to be? community of New York. How, how did that come to be? I think it's because of his uh, mom, right? His mom actually worked in, I guess, what was the welfare office? The uh, welfare department office uh, yeah. as, as an inspector. Yeah, so. So, so I think that they looked at poverty and race differently than many Irish Americans. And, and the same thing with Pete Hamill. Apparently his mother would not allow any kind of racist talk in the house at all. And you can imagine an Irish family in the 30s and 40s that was... There was there was friction in neighborhoods. There was yeah. racism. There was I I, I I tell you they weren't very popular in my house. My dad was a New York City cop. Oh goodness! And um, yeah, we I'm got sure. the Daily News. We were a Daily News family. But Jimmy was very tough on the New York City cops. Okay. So they were not really popular in my household. Okay. But okay. but that didn't they went against their tribe in, yeah. in many ways. Yeah. We have a kind of a fun story about a a woman police officer, right. Sibylla Borges, right. who is I, uh, I think she's the shortest police Four officer in the head. history of the department, <laughs> but she was a really good cop. Before she was a cop, she posed nude for a magazine before she went on the force. And these cops uh, got her fired. And Jimmy went crazy and he wrote all these columns and he ended up getting her reinstated. Well, the police and she went on to have a full a, career. The police yeah. union took an ad in the paper Attacking Jimmy. Attacking Jimmy. For, that, they <laughs> for, like defending, for defending this woman. For defending this woman. And so he would speak up for ordinary people. He did. Yeah. Um, John's son of Sam mm. reached out to Jimmy too, didn't he? That's right. Who else would uh, son of Sam reach out to? <laughs> yeah. Jimmy Resin? I mean, Serial it, killer. In, in some ways, it makes it makes sense. He was such a big uh, personality, and of course, uh, Jimmy lured him in in a sense by uh, by. Uh, Flattering him uh, uh, with respect to his uh, fine writing. Uh, yeah, he abilities. praised the killer's use of the semicolon. He yeah, said, this, he did. The he writing was it. so good, I thought Hamill did it. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you wonder what they would. We're talking about uh, Hamill and uh, Breslin and Hamill, folks, Deadline Artists, premiering on HBO January 28th with John Block, Jonathan Alter, and Steve McCarthy. You, you wonder, again, I can't help but compare that era to today. And mm -hmm. how much we have lost. I mean, and, and some of the people you talk to comment on that toward the end. I mean, there are pros and cons to it, but I don't know that we'll ever see anything like that again, at least in, in, in print journalism. And then what's online is so short-lived. People jump from, from online source to online source because they're so short-lived. It's, it's really unfortunate that in journalism, We've lost their kind. Well, we may be in a period of disruption right now. Okay. So maybe things will settle down, and maybe, as Bob Crowich says in the film, they will swim into place as okay. people to replace them. We're hoping. I, mean, I teach journalism at Montclair State University, yes. and I'm trying to get my students to understand. We're going to use this film as a teaching tool. I hope professors and teachers do for many years good, to come good, good, good. because I think we need to teach. And these are the kids that came from the neighborhoods like Jimmy and Pete did, the, the teachers yeah. kids I teach. Yeah. So we need that perspective to be continued, and we need them. I, I hope the demand becomes evident, and then yeah. the need is filled. What do you think? If not, game over. Well, I yeah. it's never game over. You know, the media is always changing. There's a kind of continuity. We have a lot of smart young people. We have a greater multiplicity of voices than we used to have, you know, and so more people can tell their stories, more people have access to platforms that allow them to tell their stories, all of which is good. Um, the problem is that with that uh, multiplicity of voices, you, you get a lot of crap online. That's right, that's right. And, and so... And people you know, have to discern right. the legitimate journalists or legitimate truth tellers versus... The trolls. Right. Yeah. So Steve Brill, who founded the American Lawyer and Court TV, he's got a new organization that's just starting called NewsGuard. It's kind of like a good housekeeping seal of approval. I see. Now, it doesn't necessarily agree with the politics. It's not liberal or conservative. It's just, is this a basically reliable source or not? So I think we're right now in the process of sorting out 
how we're going to deal with all this. But as Gloria Steinem says in our film, you know, storytelling goes back to the cavemen and cave women. <laughs> yes, she does. You she know, does you know so that will never the die. It will be in, be in new right. bottles and, and we'll see it in, you know, old wine and new bottles. But, but um, eventually this will sort itself out after we get through this very uh, painful transition period in the news business. The film vindicates yeah. me in two ways. One, um, you know, just in terms of them being journalists. You know, nowadays people look at those of us who share opinion as not being journalists, but I think one of the commentators mm-hmm. said in the film that Jimmy did have an opinion, obviously, he was a columnist, but it was based on facts based and real news. So, reporting. you know, and so I think that, you know, I, I've had to defend myself, well, Mark, you're not a journalist. Well, I report the news, then I share my opinion. But somewhere in the mix, I'm actually reporting the real news that's going on and the facts. And then the second way, because, again, we learned, and I guess we call this a new journalism, Mm -hmm. they obviously sought, like, he went to see, meant to meet Pollard, Jimmy did, Mm -hmm. um, uh, JFK's grave grave digger. uh, Grave digger. digger, And that's what I learned. You, When you start up here in macro, you don't have a lot of places to go that set you apart from other journalists. I mean, anybody can say who, what, when, where, why in that context but when you go to the to the smallest you know part of the story and then expand from there it gives you know a lot more opportunity for that flower to bloom so well, I, i've that, always yeah, i've always felt that is, way yeah that lesson's going to be taught it is taught in journalism schools all okay, over okay. look the other direction first of all yeah and then look at the the every man and how this is affecting this great big national story a president is dead he goes to washington there's ten thousand journalists there covering charles de gaulle senators movie stars right, right. what does he do he looks the other way Goes to the guy who was digging the grave in Arlington. Yeah. For how much? How much an hour? It was two dollars and two five cents. Three dollars and one cent. Three dollars and one cent. That's what it was. Yeah, yeah. And, and and, but but I I really bristle at the idea of people saying, "Oh, you're not a journalist. You're Thank you. you're a top radio journalist." <laughs> Thank you. You know it it it, it is. Jonathan Sanders, I'll just it is that. this idea Validate that me. somehow the only <laughs> people who are journalists are people who are writing like right down the middle for the Associated Press or something. Yeah. There's a lot of ways to yeah. be a journalist. Right the down most, the middle, Andrew. The most important, <laughs> the most important function we have. The, the the reason we're protected by the Constitution. We're the only industry that's protected by the Constitution explicitly. No other industry is mentioned. In our Constitution right, is right. because our founders knew that we needed to have people who would speak truth to power Amen. and be a check on on the powerful. And so anybody who's doing that, whether they're expressing their opinion or not expressing their opinion, they are uh, performing a journalistic function. If you go too far, you know, um, to like like going to you know like embracing candidates, endorsing right, candidates. Right. Sean Hannity, I think, is now by his own account said, "I'm not a journalist anymore. He's just a partisan." Because you have to, if you're a journalist, you have to be willing to say some critical things about the good guys and some That's nice right. things about the right, bad guys. Right, right, right. You have to call. You have to have an independence. Right. So if you're, if you, mm-hmm. it's not objectivity. Mm-hmm. That that you word doesn't report know. with integrity doesn't wherever, the, wherever the story doesn't really falls. Exist. You can be very opinionated. That's not objective. But you have to be independent. You can't be anybody's flunky. You know, if you are just taking your orders from the White House the way right. Sean Hannity right, right, is, right, right, right. that's or giving the orders. Or giving the orders to the White House. <laughs> but, but, but there's another thing. And just that, to, that can just, happen on the left, but le- less so. So Fox is really, there's a real question about, you know, some guys at Fox do some real journalism, but the network as a whole, it's become an organ of a political party. That's not That's journalism. right. No, that's not. That's not. Well, it, as you yeah. mentioned objectivity, as Steve brought it up too, though, now this, this is, if it is objectivity still around, it it's not doesn't really work because sometimes in journalism today, people try to seek objectivity for objectivity's sake to the point where they create sometimes a false equivalency. Right. right. Just right. to show, oh, I'm objective, but climate, it's not really. It's not climate objective. change is one of the principal climate it's phony, change. Right? It's we, phony we, balance. Sometimes, yeah, phony you're, balance, just, sometimes right, you're right, so right, respectful right. of the other opinion, you're not, you're not respectful of, the, of, of, of other opinions. Truth. That's right, that's yeah. true. That's so open-minded, your brain falls out. <laughs> you know, but the, the, but the, this film, you know, we really hope in President Hamill Deadline Artists that we, it's not a journalism seminar, but we want to raise some of these things while making an right, enter- entertaining right, right. film. And, you know, Robert De Niro's in it. As I mentioned, Spike Lee. We've got 
Tom Brokaw. There's and, some fun in it too. There's it a is lot fun. of fun. Yeah, folks, we don't we don't mean to sound too professorial. Yeah, yeah. You really will enjoy yeah. it, and it'll bring back some memories of some stories that have been covered over the years. How did they influence each of you? You 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 all. Knew we that. spent a lot of time with them. We spent dozens of hours with them in in the last couple of years of Jimmy's life. And but I mean, before that, you all knew them. Yeah, right? I knew them back to the eighties. Yeah, I covered Breslin. We did things together. Sometimes I met him. Uh, sometimes I read Pete's books. You sure. I think for me personally, what it, what growing up in in an environment that I did, it showed that you can go against your tribe and be and yeah. they really were courageous about that. They didn't care that people of their own tribe were critical of them. They just followed their heart and followed the facts. I, I came to school, uh, uh, I came to New York in the 70s, and they and Jimmy and Pete helped frame my sensibility about New York politics and the okay. social fabric. And okay. they also put a stamp on my kind of journalism. I, I like to think of myself as a shoe leather reporter. Yeah. You walk the yeah. walk, you don't just you don't just email, you don't just telephone. Yeah, actually, John locked on a lot of doors for this movie. He found a lot of the people. Okay. He was the guy that went and found them and persuaded the authorities yeah. to let us shoot in Harlington Cemetery. And he yeah. actually became very Breslin like for a yes, while yes. there yes. in many, many episodes. Been, John had been a legendary Dateline NBC producer. Sure, and sure, sure. we never would have, that scene you were talking about with Pollard and Gravedigger's son, uh, we never would no, have had that if John. That I had given great. up, John. Kept it going. Just one other thing that I learned, Mark. Please. Writing. Even if you're not a professional journalist, even if you just have something, you know, in your drawer that you write for yourself or to show your kids, you can learn something from our film about how to write well. And we really tried to do something that's very hard to do in a movie, which was have it be at least in part about writing. Uh, Jimmy uh, has passed away. How's Pete? He's, He's ailing. You know, he's frail. Um, but he's as but sharp he's as ever. Sharp as ever. Yeah, yeah. it seemed that way. Well, God bless him. Uh, Breslin and Hamill, folks, Deadline Artist premiering on HBO January 20th. Check it out. You'll enjoy it. Uh, I can only imagine what they will be doing with Trump. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, that's the subtext of the film. Yeah, that would, that would be <laughs> yeah. amazing. the whole thing. Uh, yeah. You know, just what they'd be doing on the whole scene. Um, so... Um, Folks, check it out on HBO. Thank you to Steve McCarthy, Jonathan Alter, John Block. Pleasure to see you, gentlemen. Thank you, Thanks, Mark. Thanks for having us. We look forward to seeing more from you. Folks, we'll be back. This is MIP.